When I read the phrase, I am the bread of life, I must admit that the, the word bread jumps out at me. And I say that because I can remember when I began to study Spanish a number of years ago, one of the teachers, an anthropologist, invited all of us in the class to think about the word bread and to try to visualize or form a, an image in our mind of what bread was for us. And of course, for me, coming from Canada, it was that loaf of bread in the, in the plastic wrapper. But for others, it was round. Some others, it was flat. For others, it was like a tortilla, and others, it was like a croissant. It was a roll. And I became very aware that a word has many meanings. And equally, when we look at the word today, the bread of life, what comes to mind is the diversity of cultures. I have a, a poster on the wall outside my office, and on it, it says, the world in which you were born is just one model of reality. Other cultures are not failed attempts at being you. They are unique manifestations of the human spirit. And just as the bread of life, Jesus, has a depth and a, and a richness, there's a depth and a richness in the diversity of relationships with Jesus and the way the different cultures understand his presence, the way that Jesus is the bread of life for them. But Jesus, above all, is the bread of life, the food that sustains and nourishes. It's ours for the taking. It's gift. It's something that is accessible to all of us as a daily nourishment. It's the new relationship with God, a relationship of trust, discernment, and obedience to God's will, a profound relationship of love made possible by Jesus, by his death and resurrection. The hunger and the thirst are gone, and our hearts can find what they're searching for, and life ceases to be just mere existence. Today's first reading speaks to us of an important chapter in the history of the church. The church began as a, as a group of Jewish people, as a Jewish institution, if you will. In chapter 6 of Acts, we read about the first conflict, the first tensions in that community when the first Gentiles came to join the community, and there was a debate about compliance with Jewish law and customs. But the death of Stephen was a catalyst for a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem and compelled the Christians to scatter and to seek safety in the remoter districts of the country as well as abroad. And where they went, they took the gospel. And in this chapter of Acts, which we begin today in chapter 8, we see the church reaching out However, at this stage in the history of the church, there is no definite plan or conception of a world mission. When we read this chapter, in the light of what was soon to happen, we see the church, a community of believers, unconsciously but irresistibly being moved toward her destiny. And this should be an important reminder for all of us that the Holy Spirit is both the source and the author of mission. It wasn't planned. It was the movement of the Spirit. As for Saul, for Paul, he ravaged the church, provoking havoc. He went into house after house and dragged people out, the Christians, the men and women, and put them under arrest. But the contrast between this man who wreaked havoc and the man that we find in the next chapter, in chapter 9, with the encounter on the road to Damascus, a man who surrendered himself to Christ, we recognize once again the work of the Holy Spirit, the source the author of mission. But the Christians were scattered. The apostles stayed still. They stood their ground and braved whatever dangers came their way. What a change, what a dramatic change from the way they had been. But again, they were strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and they now showed great courage. When we think of a ship that's fighting a raging storm, people who are experienced or the fishermen will tell us, you head into the storm, you head directly into the storm. You don't turn away from it. And that's really what the apostles did. The storm of persecution was before them, and they stayed, they confronted it. They showed the courage that they had been given. I can't help but think that they were very conscious of that scene in the upper room. When Thomas came and put his hands in the wounds of the risen Christ and discovered the presence of the risen Christ in the wounds, in the wounds, 
that we are invited to face both the raging storm and to discover Christ in the womb, in the wounds. And we're to face that with integrity, with courage, and the conviction that the truth will always set us free, that the Holy Spirit will accompany us as it did the apostles in the quest for truth, for justice, and for reconciliation. As a church, we must recognize that we do not fully celebrate the resurrection without being in touch and dealing with the wounds in the body of Christ. The apostles were determined to face whatever dangers threatened them, and so must we. We must remember the repeated invitations of Jesus to have the wounded present, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. It's a constant reminder that salvation is a gift to all, and so we pray this day, Father, send in your name the Holy Spirit, who will teach us everything, who will remind us of every word of Jesus, and who will stay with us forever. For we believe that the Holy Spirit will sustain us and strengthen us, as well as console us along the difficult paths and storms that we face. We pray that the Spirit of the risen Christ will lead us to truth by being true to ourselves and true to the teaching of Jesus as disciples. Amen. Please stand. We gather this day in the presence of our God who invites us to make known our intentions. And so we present this day the many intentions of the people who join us via television. They've asked that we remember all of those intentions. So for them and for those intentions, we pray to the Lord. We pray for the intentions of all of us here gathered that God may touch our hearts, that all of us may feel the experience and the power of the Holy Spirit present in our lives. And for that gift for each and every one of us, we pray to the Lord. And we pray for people who this day suffer the effects of war. We pray that they will know God's peace. And for them, we pray to the Lord. And all of this we ask through Christ our Lord. 